Welcome to this week's online service from Beaconloft Baptist Church here in Gateshead. It is good to be back with you again. Since we last met, I've broken a tooth, caught COVID, read six books whilst in isolation. I've now managed a negative COVID test and things are getting back to normal. So wherever you are this morning, I'd like to welcome you and I'd like to pray for you. Heavenly Father, Creator God, from whom every good gift comes, we gather to worship you today. You are an awesome God, greater than our comprehension or our imagination. You are beyond any word we could ever use to describe you. And yet, through Jesus, we know the intimacy of your vast love. We come to you in thanksgiving and praise to acknowledge that you are God and to place our lives anew into your hands. Enlarge our vision this hour with your word, instill in us again your hope, your peace, your joy, your love. May your Holy Spirit surround and indwell us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. few verses now from one of my favourite psalms. This is Psalm 25. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. And teach me, for you are my saviour and my hope is in you all day long. My Jesus, 
This Sunday is Sea Sunday, an opportunity to think and pray about the lives of seafarers, their families and those who support them. The Mission to Seafarers was set up to provide vital help and support to those who work at sea. Without their essential service, we would see our economy crumble and our way of life evaporate. Offering practical, emotional or spiritual support where needed to seafarers regardless of any nationality or belief, the Mission to Seafarers aims to provide as much help as possible to all seafarers through our representation at over 175 ports across 50 different countries. We would not be able to continue to offer this charitable service without the kind donations and volunteered time which is offered towards our work. A few days ago I met Ariel, he's from the Philippines. He came up to me and said, you're from the Flying Angel? I said, yes. He said, ah, oh, I go there in the Philippines. And so while I was caring for Ariel here in the port of Hull, 
The mission was caring for his family back home, but here in the port I was able to offer him Wi-Fi so he could speak to his family. As I'm caring for seafarers here in the port of Hull, so are my colleagues around the world in various other ports. The mission to seafarers at our centre in Manila was running Christmas parties for his wife and children to go to and other social events. And by caring for their families, we are caring for seafarers around the world. Let us pray. For the world's harvest, for the fruits of land and sea, for the creativity of different nations and cultures, and for the seafarers who bring these cargoes to the ports of the world, we thank you, Lord. For the courage, steadfastness, and devotion of all those who serve at sea, for their skills of seamanship, engineering, and navigation the willingness of seafarers to serve and live a life of sacrifice in order that we might have an abundance of goods and supplies. We thank you, Lord. We also thank you for the work of dedicated chaplains, volunteer ship visitors, and all those in the world who minister to the needs of seafarers. We pray especially for those who are far from their loved ones during these days, who suffer dislocation in their lives, who experience the despair of isolation, who are fearful of piracy on their voyages, and who longingly seek respite, friendship, comfort and support. Lord, we pray in your mercy that you will bless them. We pray also for those who carry out the services in the ports and harbours, who crew the lifeboats, and who watch over the coast. Lord, Bless them, we pray. We ask for peace and harmony for our nations as we emerge from these challenging times. May we take better care of your world for the sake of future generations and of all nature. May we each, just where we are, try to reach out in love to those who need our help and support, following your example. We pray for our government and the governments of the world. It has been a week like no other. We pray for wisdom and good decision making. We grieve with those that grieve. Be with them as they navigate the seas of sorrow. We place our trust in your unfailing love. We acknowledge that you are our God and creator and that this is your world and that you are our eternal Father, who is strong to save. Amen.
This week's reading is from Galatians, it's chapter 2, and we're going to read from verses 15 to 21. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. How deep the Father's love for us. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son, and make a wretch his treasure, how great the pain of searing loss, the father turns his face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Hi, 
I'm Jane Kitson. I'm part of the leadership team at Bilkey Community Church. It's a real pleasure to be able to join with you as you journey through the book of Galatians. We're at the end of chapter two this week and there was a lot of straight talking as there is in the whole book. Paul doesn't mince his words. The themes of truth, freedom, grace and justification by faith are a challenge to us today just as they would have been to the early church. Last week, Irene spoke about some of the challenges that come along with leadership and also about unity and explained the context behind some of the Jewish customs of the time. This week, we're going to grapple with some of the verses that lie right at the heart of what it means to know, love and follow Jesus. But you know, there would have been difficult reading for the first century Jewish audience. I wonder if they make difficult reading for us as well today. Let's read together from Galatians chapter 2. Paul says, We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Just before these verses, earlier in chapter two, we've read about how Paul challenged Peter because he felt that Peter was falling back into some old ways of thinking and acting, which Paul said weren't in line with the freedom that comes with the gospel of Christ. And it's really useful to just make sure we understand some of the terms that Paul uses here. When he's referring to Gentiles, he's just talking about people who aren't Jews. And we remember that actually Paul's calling from God was primarily to, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, just as Peter had been called to preach to the Jews. So Paul is writing to Jewish believers in the churches in Galatia who would have spent most of their lives studying the law. And by this, we mean mainly the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament. And many Jewish believers would have learned all of these writings by heart and meditated on them and discussed them and thought on them at length. They would have diligently followed the rules and traditions that their people had followed for centuries. Rules about what to eat and what not to eat, what to do on the Sabbath and what not to do. What makes someone clean or unclean? What to sacrifice and when? And of course, they would have been circumcised as a symbol of their commitment to God as a male Jew. There were 613 laws that Jews tried to observe. 365 of them were don'ts and 248 were do's. To be honest, I think it must have been exhausting trying to just remember all of them, let alone keep them. I wonder how many of us can even remember the Ten Commandments when we're put under pressure. And that's what Paul is talking about when he's talking about people who feel that pressure to keep the law, to earn their way into God's favour. It's interesting sometimes, you know, to ask people um, maybe who aren't followers of Jesus, what do you think we have to do to be right with God, to 
to have an eternity spent in heaven with him. So many people say you need to live a good life. It's interesting, isn't it? I wonder how many of us have lived parts of our lives feeling that actually we're just not good enough. Feeling that we don't measure up. Like we try our hardest, but just somehow we're not worth being included in in whatever group it, it is or whatever friendship circle it might be. I was definitely a people pleaser when I was younger and to be honest I probably still am to some extent Um, and when I was at school I genuinely lived in fear of of getting into trouble. I remember thinking oh I can't do anything wrong what if somebody tells my mum and dad that I've done something wrong and what if they're disappointed in me. I just hated the thought of that and I remember losing my temper once I was a teenager um, in a, a friendly football kick around and I lost my rag and I was started shouting at one of the players and it was a church youth group friendly football kick around as well and I remember distinctly immediately saying afterwards please don't tell my mum I said that I just couldn't cope with either the feeling of having done the wrong thing or that my parents <laughs> might find out and be cross with me or upset or just disappointed And I wonder if some of the early Jewish believers felt a bit like that. Worried about everything that they said and did in case they somehow got it wrong or forgot something that they were meant to do. Concerned that they would upset God and and displease him. What a burden. What a burden. It must have been so inhibiting, imprisoning. Because actually we all know, don't we, deep down, whether we admit it or not, that We're not perfect, we do mess up, and we fall short. But the gospel of Christ is about freedom, about being saved because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, of putting our faith in him, living a new life, forgiven by the wonderful grace of God. But you know what a huge change in thinking that must have been for those early Jewish believers? They spent their whole lives focused on the law. You can see how over the months and over the years, doubts could easily have crept in. Really, how could God possibly be happy for you to eat anything you want? How can God not be bothered about circumcision when we've been practising it all the way back to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? You see, actions are measurable, they're visible, you can tick them off on a checklist. And I guess without leaders who were absolutely sure of the gospel message, little by little, it would have been easy to slip into ways of thinking that superficially might seem like they're right, but actually at the heart they really aren't. And it's just as easy for us to slip into those ways of thinking today too. To think that God is more bothered about the superficial than the depths of our heart. Sometimes we can confuse trying to please people with trying to please God. And the things that people see aren't the things that God sees. Now I love tennis. It's the men's Wimbledon final this afternoon so you know what I'll be doing after I've had my lunch today. I love to play tennis, although I'm really not very good at it. Um, Thankfully, my 17-year-old son is very patient when we go and have a game together and he restrains himself from whacking the ball all over the place so that we can at least have some rallies together. It's always been a dream of mine to go to Wimbledon. And three years ago, I was so excited when I got tickets for number one court and I took my dad for his 80th birthday and it was just marvellous. And this year, Daniel and I went a week past Friday, the 1st of July, and we saw some fantastic matches. One of the matches I would have loved to have seen was the Wimbledon final in 2019 between Djokovic and Federer. It lasted just under five hours. And despite having championship points to win the whole thing, Federer lost to Djokovic 
13 games to 12 in the fifth set. You see, it wasn't good enough to do nearly everything right and play amazing tennis and to do better than the 126 other players in the singles draw. Without winning the last point, Federer still lost. He played an amazing game, but he was still defeated. And it's like that, in a way, with trying to be right with God through obeying the law and, and doing good works, we can be doing so well, but we will still slip up at some point and lose it. In this passage, Paul is so clear that we're not made right in the eyes of God because of what we do or whether we can keep his laws perfectly because none of us can do that. It's impossible. The only one who could do that was Jesus and it's all about him, Paul says. We're made right with God and that's what Paul calls being justified because Jesus went to the cross in our place, in my place. He was punished in our place, in my place. And when I turn to him and put my faith in him, it's then just as if I'd never been in that place needing to be punished. I am justified. I should be declared guilty, but Jesus declares me free to go and wipes the slate completely clean. Now, I would bet that most of us listening to this know this in our heads. But actually, do we always live like this? You see, over the years, I think it's easy to develop our own ways of doing things, our own ideas of what's acceptable Christian behaviour and what's not. We can so easily set standards for ourselves that actually aren't God's standards at all. Now, Just to be clear, the fruit of faith can absolutely be seen in the choices we make, in the things that we say and we do, how we live our lives. Real faith absolutely should have fruit. How we live does matter. But our lifestyle should result from our love for Jesus and it should never be like a weight around our neck a snare or a trap or a substitution for faith. And we shouldn't look to impose our own ways of doing things on others unless we're confident that they have a scriptural basis or have come as a clear and confirmed direction from God. Just like those early Christians defaulted to certain actions to reinforce what they believed to be their faith and also looked to please other people, maybe well-meaning or influential people or maybe people who were more experienced in faith than they were. We can easily do that as well today. A couple of daft examples really. Do we expect people to dress in a certain way when they come to church? Maybe to not have certain hairstyles? Do we expect people to sit in a particular way in our services? What if someone wanted to come in and sit on the floor? (laughs) Should people raise their arms in worship and close their eyes or, or dance or stay silent and still? Now, I'm just picking those out as as little daft examples, really. And of course, it's so right for our churches to be places of respect and awe. And of course, we have to have a general consensus of how, how to do things when we're together rather than just chaos. But sometimes our little ways of, of doing things can get in the way of faith growing and developing and can hold people back. And actually, so can our desire to serve I know myself that I I find it easier to to do things rather than sit still and just be still and, and listen to the Lord. I'm not consciously trying to earn God's approval, but I do think that subconsciously I'm assuming that he's actually really pleased with the hours that I spend in serving him. And I can forget that he sometimes he just wants me to be still and know that he is God. Paul says in this section of Galatians, faith first. And it's such good news 
for any of us who feel that we're never quite good enough, for any of us who are painfully aware of uh, the ways that we fall short, for any of us who keep on measuring ourselves up to others that we think are better than us, and any of us who are always feeling like we're just second best. We do fall short, but God forgives us, accepts us, and loves us regardless. We don't need to live feeling as if we failed, as if we don't measure up. We can live knowing that Jesus has succeeded and we don't have to in our own strength. We just need to love him and trust him and follow him. And that's what Paul wanted those early Christians to grasp hold of and be liberated by. None of us can get it right all of the time and it will absolutely burn us out if we try. Verse 16 of this passage reminds us that by observing the law, nobody will be justified. If we spend our lives trying to do the right thing without understanding that we need to know Jesus first and foremost, we're wasting our time. Verses 17 to 18 then throw up an interesting argument. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. If it's true that the grace of God saves us through faith and that we don't have to worry about trying to obey every last letter of the law, does that mean then that it doesn't actually matter what we do? because God will always forgive us. So can we just live as we want to, as if we're free from the shackles of the law or of our own standards of trying to do the right thing? It would be like me deliberately just doing something wrong that hurt my dad over and over and just taking it for granted that he would always be there and would forgive me. That's not love. That's not me valuing him or how he's loved me. Should we really be thinking of living by the same principles as those characters we sometimes see in the mafia movies, where they murder people who've crossed them and then turn them to confession to cleanse their souls, only to go away and do the same thing over and over again, deliberately? If grace is abundant, why worry about how we live our lives? Paul answers this argument so strongly. He says, absolutely not. He points us once again to Christ. He tells us that it's a whole way of life that we have rejected or died to when we come to faith. Jesus now lives in us. Those desires to deliberately sin, they belong to our old lives. If Jesus is truly alive in us, our faith is real. It's living. And if we truly understand, value and appreciate what Jesus has done for us on the cross, then our hearts should be absolutely yearning to please God by how we live our lives. I remember when John and I were going out together before we got married. He lived down in Middlesbrough with his parents and I lived in Hewith with my dad. And we only got to see each other a couple of times a week. And when I used to go down to see him, he would always make me lovely cups of tea. And I can clearly remember the look one day on his dad's face when he came into the sitting room and he saw the cup of tea and he realised that John had made it for me. John made it, he said. Well, wonders will never cease. Didn't even know he knew how to make tea. When we truly love someone, we show it in our actions, not as a duty, but as a delight. And incidentally, he still makes me a lovely cup of tea every morning. Paul finishes this section of the letter by making a brutally clear point. If keeping laws and living right could save us and make us right with God, then Jesus dying on the cross was pointless. Christ died for nothing. We're missing the point of the gospel, missing the point of salvation. And if we as 21st century Christians are presenting to others a gospel which focuses more on how we should live than on knowing Jesus and having his life within us, then we're missing the point too. Because it's only when we have the spirit of God living within us that our lives can change at all. Jesus spent his time hanging out with tax collectors, prostitutes, the poor and needy, the sick, the uneducated, 
the outcasts, the people who felt they didn't matter and they didn't fit in. And they far outnumbered the wealthy and important in his contacts, although of course the wealthy and important were there as well. And he had strong words to say to the people who had a veneer of respectability and the religious leaders who had completely missed the point of the heart of God. Now, Paul had been one of those kind of people too. He never tries to hide his past. He's always very open about how he used to persecute believers before Jesus appeared to him so clearly and so powerfully. Paul knew what it was like to come from a background of legalism and keeping score of the law. And perhaps more than most in the early church, he really knew how amazingly different it was to live in the freedom of the grace of Christ. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 15, Paul describes himself as the chief of sinners. He knew that Jesus, who had lived a perfect, sinless life, was counted as guilty in his place. He knew that not only did Jesus take the punishment that he, Paul, deserved, but Paul benefited from that by receiving grace and forgiveness that he did not deserve. In verse 20, Paul says that he no longer lives, but Christ lives in him. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Wow. This is the extent of God's love for you and for me. He gave himself to the suffering of the cross for you and for me. His unconditional love spans the centuries and connects with us here on earth and with eternity. There's nothing we can physically do to make God love us more than he does already or less than he does already. And when Paul understood this, it transformed his life. Do we truly believe it? It's the heart of the gospel message. It's simple and yet so profound. And it's countercultural then and now for societies that like to have measurable evidence of success. Smart objectives, SWOT analyses, measurable outcome, outcomes. Not in the kingdom of God. It's all about faith. No wonder Paul felt compelled to stand up to Peter to defend this gospel. No wonder he didn't want believers to fall back into the old way of thinking, of being hemmed in by traditions, laws and customs. Things that may not be bad in themselves, but which don't actually make us right with God. Being justified by faith means we have a new way of living in Christ and putting our faith in Jesus is what's required. God's love welcomes everyone who does this. And from this great love, our lives are changed, not because we feel we have to obey a set of rules, but because we have Christ living within us. So let's leave chapter two of Galatians with a few things to think about. Taking what Paul says in verses 19 and 20, what does it mean for you and for me today, tomorrow, to live for God. What does it mean for you and for me that I no longer live but Christ lives in me? What would our lives look like if we all were living in the reality of those words? How would our friendships, our families, our communities and our workplaces be impacted? How would we spend our time, our money, How would we use our homes? What decisions and sacrifices would we have to make? Is the way we live our lives truly a reflection of how much we love Jesus and understand what he has done on the cross? Is it a reflection of our faith in him and the Holy Spirit living in us? Or are we trying with all our might just to do the right things to try to please him? And do we put aside time just to be still and rest in his wonderful love and grace? Amen.
Thanks, Jane, for sharing with us this morning. If you'd like to get in touch anytime, feel free to use the email address on the screen. Now here's Irene with our time of prayer for the fellowship. Let's pray. We know the uh, generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and that even though he was rich for our sakes, he became poor so that by his poverty, he could make us rich. We're a blessed people, Lord. You give us uh, so much, you care about us, you hear our prayers and you love us always. Our concerns this week are for Clark, who uh, sadly has COVID. We ask that you would uh, help him recover. We pray for Adam and Peggy too, Lord, who have succumbed to this awful virus. We ask your healing hand upon them. We thank you for answered prayer this week uh, because Hazel's improving and we just ask that she may have a, a full recovery because uh, we've missed her. We thank you that Ian has recovered from his bout of COVID. So we commit our new venture of place of welcome to you, Lord, and ask that it may gradually grow and become just that, a place where people can come and find friendship and fellowship and a safe environment. So we ask your blessing on this work. We pray for our friends in residential accommodation. We think of uh, Jimmy. We ask that you'd be with him, Olive, Sadie and Joan Holland we, and, and Alf Rutherford too, Lord. We ask that uh, you would just be with each of them and keep them safe and happy. We remember those of us, Lord, who are struggling, hurting, maybe through bereavement or ill health or isolation. We ask that you would draw near and give all of us um, something that would just draw us closer to yourself and give us your peace. We thank you for your guiding hand and direction as we are without a pastor just now and, and we thank you for those who are stepping up to uh, take on extra responsibility. We ask that we would uh, be constantly praying for the way you want us to go and what you want us to do as a church. So we thank you for Jesus, your Son, our Lord and Redeemer. And we ask all of these things and our prayers in his lovely name. Amen. Thanks, Irene. We'll conclude our service with a hymn I'm sure they'll be singing a few times over the next few weeks at the Keswick Convention. How great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. Son not sparing Sent him to die I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin Then sings my soul
acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great How great they are from our friends at the Village Chapel. I'd like to close now with these words from Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. As we journey through life, may we never lose our sense of direction, never lose sight of the landmark to which we travel. And should cloud or rain obscure our vision, may we draw closer to you, O Lord, so that our feet may tread in your footsteps. Your words be our encouragement and your love our protection against the storms that assail us. May the road rise up to meet us. May the wind be always at our back. May the sun shine warm upon our faces and until we meet again, May God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. I hope you'll join us again next week. We end with a version of Abide With Me by students from the Fountain View Academy in British Columbia, Canada.